Our story begins at Outlaw Moon, a tabletop gaming and collectible consignment shop in central Austin, Texas. Home to a variety of Dungeoned Dragons and games that require tables, the shop will also happily purchase all of the toys and things your parents forced you to sell when you moved back in with them to pay down your crippling art school debt. Now, I'd be lying to you if I said that I frequent this shop, but I do stop into the neighboring designer toy store and comic shop from time to time. So every so often, I'll find myself wandering in and admiring all the old memorabilia, for which I have zero nostalgia for. And on one of my recent excursions, I encountered a very interesting box with an odd name and a robot on the front that looked a bit like a storage shed with legs. The original owner seemingly got the thing labeled as the Robotech Defender Zoltech for the cost of a club sandwich in suburban Ohio at a department store liquidation sale, right around the same time that I began sprouting many new and exciting patches of hair. I spent more than that, but it was a small price to pay to gaze into the abyss of Western anime licensing. As previously mentioned, the Zoltec looks a bit like a set of old construction equipment atop a pair of legs. Which is to say that the Dugram from Bang of the Sun Dugram looks like a set of old construction equipment atop a pair of legs. They are, after all, the exact same thing, as Ravel began selling the Dugram under this name back in 1984. Ravel had just licensed a bunch of old model stock from Japanese model maker Takara, from Bang of the Sun Dugram, Super Dimension Century Orgus, and Super Dimension Fortress Macross, to keep the company afloat amid a crash in the overall global toy market, at least until they could eventually merge with old rival Monogram Toys. Assuming names like Super Dimension Fortress were a bit too extra for 80s youths, Ravel mixed them all together and gave them a new and catchy, focus-grouped name for children to scream at their suburban American parents from the back of a minivan between trips to the local mall. That name was Robotech Defenders. Which must have been confusing when said screaming child opened the box for the first time, only for the runners to still say Dugram on them. As for the kit, it's a product of its time, really. Parts are big color swirls are plentiful. It's fine, albeit relatively uninteresting. But the story behind its infamous western nameplate is anything but. For many anime aficionados, Robotech is a trigger word synonymous with the bastardization of Japanese culture to appeal to American audiences many of whom also grew up with things like Voltron without a care in the world for what a Beast King Go Lion or Armored Fleet Die Rugger XV were. But in the early 80s, Robotech was just a branding for a toy line, one which would prove problematic for a little-known television production house called Harmony Gold. Harmony Gold had the North American distribution rights to several emerging Japanese anime series in the early 80s including the aforementioned Macross, episodes of which they started out by distributing via mail order on VHS tapes. The episodes were dubbed in English primarily by a guy named Carl Masick. Or Makik or Makik, I really don't know how to pronounce these things, you guys should know this by now, who came up with the idea of getting the show on television, having already been familiar with the industry through selling anime merch in Orange County, in California. This, however, was well before the days of hyper-saturated, online-dominated television distribution through multi-billion dollar megacorporations merged with other multi-billion dollar megacorporations. And since cable was still in its infancy, if you wanted to get something on television, you had to go through one of the three major networks that owned most of the airwaves. So, not all that different from today, really. And in order to do that, 
you usually needed to offer something up as what's called a syndicated series. Usually about 65 episodes, ran every weekday with flexible time slots so the network could bump your program because the channel director thought badminton at 11 in the morning would be more interesting. This posed a problem for Harmony Gold, since Macross, the longest show in their catalog, only clocked in at 36 episodes. Masick noted similarities between Macross and two other series in Harmony Gold's possession, Super Dimension Calvary Southern Cross and Genesis Climber Mospiata. Mospiata. Where can we just drop the pre I don't know how to pronounce things. He proposed mashing the three together and changing up the story a bit to make it mostly make sense, then pitch it for syndication. And amazingly, the pitch worked. Meanwhile, Ravel was busy pitching their new IP to other willing parties. And since television was out of the question, the company turned to DC Comics for a way to tap into the 80s giant robot money faucet. 11 pages of Google searching turned up very little about how the relationship between the two companies came to be. But I assume it had something to do with a conference room and a graph representing money pointing up and to the right. DC would then later, rather excitedly, at a second line labeled cost of production pointing down and also to the right. A half dozen American men in tasteful suits would then applaud their capital gains, all with the same stock photo corporate smile plastered across their faces. The kind that doesn't really meet the eyes, but is enough to move the meeting forward so everyone can get back to their 80s cocaine having. DC would be paid an undisclosed to Google.com sum of money to publish a three issue miniseries flushing out the world of Robotech Defenders and its shoe-horned robots. Bearing no resemblance to the original properties the designs came from, because internet anime piracy hadn't been invented yet and companies could still get away with these things, Robotech Defenders weaved an impressive story of alien factions uniting against a common enemy, who itself is starved of resources and turns hostile in a fit of desperation. At least, it would be impressive, if plot threads that would usually take up an entire issue in something like Batman weren't introduced and resolved in a single panel. The pacing of the Robotech Defenders comic is rushed faster than a AAA video game pushed to market to distract from multiple federal lawsuits related to workplace harassment. About as much time was spent on character design and colorization. Most of the characters, as such, look as if they could be lifted from really any given limited sci-fi comic series of the same era, and the cost-effective flexographic coloring system used on Robotech Defenders the comic makes the imagery pop off the page as well as a photocopied homework assignment from grade school. The budget cuts forced teachers to reuse toner. Now. You'll be shocked to learn that cheap printing and a warp speed plot didn't exactly translate to smash success. So much so that upon the release of the second issue, the six readers still purchasing the comic were greeted by this blurb inside the front cover, announcing that for issues too numerous to describe, the already minuscule three issue miniseries was cut to two but you wouldn't see advertising for chewing gum or allegedly free t-shirts, or for Robotech Force model kits for that matter. So that's something. As such, the Robotech Defenders comic faded off into obscurity, not unlike the Robotech Defenders model kits themselves. The Not Dugram, as mentioned earlier, is pretty standard, uninspired 80s plastic model tat. Pieces are held together with equal parts hope and plastic cement, and a range of motion is more in the builder's imagination than in the joints themselves. It also seems that the plastic was not exactly quality tested for the scenario of sitting in a hot storage unit for 20 years before making its way to a used toy shop in central Texas. The warped cannon I unwrapped could probably easily be fixed with some cement and maybe a heat gun, but I prefer to believe that this was the result of some Looney Tunes-style tomfoolery with a pumpkin in the barrel when it went to fire. It's clear, then, that Revel's badge engineering of the Dugram and its fellow ilk clearly did not see much in the way of plastic modeling improvements before getting the Robotech name, either. 
1984, when kits were getting prepped to be sold stateside, Ravel was sold off by their multinational corporate overlords, here we go again pronunciation, Journalé du Jolet. <laughs> Do I look? <laughs> Generally du Joet. It's on the screen. I don't. <laughs> How did you say words? <laughs> to cut their own losses. And the closure of their in house American based molding, tooling, and manufacturing facilities followed soon after. Faced with waning demand for the plastic tanks and things modern kids associated with their weird uncle's basement, about the only thing still making money in the toy industry in the early 80s was giant robots. So it makes sense that Ravel would jump in on the craze while Harmony Gold swept up whatever mecha properties they could get their hands on. And as it turns out, those properties, despite all the hate and vitriol their licensing Chimera receives from people on the internet in current year, were a major flashpoint for anime in America. Since Harmony Gold had the TV rights, and Ravel had the model kit and toy rights, the two quickly hashed out a co-branding deal that would result in Harmony Gold's syndication experiment taking on the name Robotech. With DC Comics getting the There Is No War in Ba Sing Se treatment in the whole ordeal. The result was a smash success. A show that was a soap opera that appealed to kids as well as adults. A syndicated show with an ongoing story, something unheard of on over-the-air television in the 80s. Amazingly, when it ran locally in major market Los Angeles, it rated third place only to nightly news programs, even when it changed time slots and even entire networks. Across the country, Harmony Gold caught lightning in a bottle. For Kevin McKeever, Vice President of Marketing for Robotech, the show found success with an 18 to 49 female demographic hooked on the characters' stories, as well as the teenage boys that were the intended audience. Not unlike Gundam in Japan around the same time. That broad spectrum of discovery, McKeever credits to the show's original time slot, which captured both the after-school crowd and the soap opera crowd, creating the sort of television audience big studio execs dream of. The thing about lightning, though, is that eventually, the storms stop. The Robotech universe was quite literally headcanon, fanfiction living in Carl Masick's mind. The source material came from Japan, and Japan would not be making a continuation for the sake of an American production house. Tommy Yoon, creative director of Robotech, acknowledged to LA Weekly that, quote, it created a whole new universe storyline for which the Japanese would never make a sequel. They might make a spin-off of the original series, which indeed they did with programs like Macross Delta, but this is a merged storyline, which is something that was just in Carl's head. Nevertheless, sequels would be made, of course, including the Sentinels and, more recently, the Shadow Chronicles in the mid-2000s. And in the meantime, Masick would leave to co-found Streamline Pictures, which brought to America a couple films you might be familiar with, and it would take 20 years to even get to the point where Harmony Gold could even attempt to get their series up and running again in their own image, with original animation. These revamps saw limited success, and the seeds of social media toxicity had already began to sprout leading to the reputation you see amongst hardcore anime enthusiasts today. Robotech and the Defenders line of model kits may have had their faults, but they certainly don't deserve the hate they get in current year. If it weren't for Harmony Gold taking a chance on thrusting giant robots in the face of an American public more used to the days of our lives, we might not have legendary films like Akira, Fist of the North Star, or many of the early Ghibli films, for which Masick's streamlined pictures was first responsible for bringing to the West. If Harmony Gold didn't take a chance on Masick and his vision, one has to wonder where anime in America would be today, without the success of a headcanon amalgamation ran as counter-programming to the nightly news. Robotech was a show where the good guys died, where characters were flawed and the future looked closer than space operas ever could be. It predated Bad Gunpla, and without it, I don't even know if we'd be here. 
So watch for Cross, watch Dugram, but show some kindness to Robotech as well. Without it, you might not be liking this video and subscribing to this channel right now. See you next time. Thank you.